Hello, bonjour, right, welcome everybody. Uh, I can't believe it, but we are already deep into February uh, and we've got another virtual online workshop for you as part of our spring se uh, winter. I've just finalized the spring series. I'm secret it's coming to you soon we'll reveal it but I'm so excited um to be learning outdoors in winter with you uh, and our fantastic guests um so we are in webinar mode uh you can let us know um that you're here by saying hi in the chat uh you can use the Q&A or the chat to pose questions for Jill and Patty and Steph um is busy beavering in the background and we'll grab them and we'll put them into a document so we can ask later you can use the reactions button you'll find that at the bottom of your black bar uh, and that can do you yeah with people have found it we've got a little toots and thumbs up um that's the only way we can see you your your spirit um because at the minute we sadly we can't do faces um all 411 of you uh and counting um so please feel free to use that also if it helps your accessibility the three buttons dots at the bottom of your black bar you can click that more button and find closed captions and turn those on uh, and that will give a live transcript as we're speaking um, if that helps you to um, engage with the learning more um, and so I, I'm going to share my screen and just dive in um, to letting you know today is the 20th of February and we have an amazing uh, couple of educators here who have been hugely influential and inspirational in my education personal life uh, here to talk stories in the wild uh, animal tracks and traces um I just wanted to take a second um to uh, offer um my acknowledgement to the land that I'm joining from um this pitch is out of season I normally have a seasonal picture but I wanted to point out the fact that it is unseasonably like spring here uh it doesn't look like this at the moment it tried to snow today a bit but the leaves and the trees are green they're not white we've got the lowest snowpack recorded and so i, I acknowledge that this is sinaiac's land and that for thousands of years um there have been informal records of of what the climate and our relationship with that the weather we see has been uh also for the sure equipment and the silks and the Tanaha First Nations who've traveled along the rivers uh, and through the mountain passes to the confluence of the Columbia, uh, the, the Swift River or the Mishkakis River, the Chickadee River as the Tanaha call it, um, that have come to this place where I am um, and have deep embedded knowledge about it. And the people that I'm talking to um, that have retained that traditional ecological knowledge are very concerned about the changes that we're seeing. And so I just want to acknowledge that um, today, my connection to the land and, and, and that acknowledgement of its people and what it compels me to do is around um, how can I learn more uh, about the balance that I need to live in in order to protect uh, and conserve uh, the environment going forward? So that's that's my personal feeling in this moment uh, about what it's important to do. Um, if you haven't been with us before, you know we have these free amazing virtual workshops. We're also doing a bit more of some deep diving with some virtual courses on teaching imagination, wild learning, which is literacy and math outside, indigenous ways of knowing with Laurie, Marie, uh, Dorian, uh, and inclusive outdoor learning. So you get four sessions with the authors of the amazing resources, and you can do a bit more of a deep dive. So you're more than welcome to join us there. We're also just about to launch I mean, we've launched it. You can sign up and it starts on March 11th. Our first ever comprehensive professional development course in outdoor learning. Uh, this is for K to 12 educators, um, 30 hours of work through your own pace and at least three and if not more, uh, 60 minute live virtual workshops to get feedback and build community of practice. Um, and we'd love to see you there. And my amazing co-pilot today is Steph from Take Me Outside. Hello, everybody. It's so lovely to have you all here. Um, I want to say, me new Elam, come inside. I hope you are comfortable and warm and cozy wherever you're calling in from. We're seeing there's I'm I'm in the chat. I'm I'm in the back end of things, doing tech support, all of that stuff. Um, so I'm always reading the chat and seeing where everyone's calling in from. And so it is lovely to see the diversity. We'll do an official poll in a minute here. You'll be able to to let us know as well there. Um, I'm calling in from uh, Vancouver Island in the west coast of Canada 
which is Coast Salish territory, and more specifically where I am is the unceded territory of the Coatzin people, the Cowichan tribes. And I always love to see when there's other folks local uh, in the chat there who are also enjoying the uh, the rain that is coming down here today. Uh, I always am struck by how much rain you can get in one part of the year and then drought in other parts of the years and how I've noticed those extremes, you know, becoming more and more uh, poignant over time. And yeah, what Jade's talking about here has got me thinking that as well. Um, yeah. Happy to be here with you all, though, to be talking about tracks and traces. But if you need anything, I'm in the chat. Uh, I'm going to try and help in that sense. Gather your questions and at, we'll ask as many as we can at the end. So I'm going to pass it back to Jade and I'm going to be putting links and things in the chat. So I know it's really busy uh, in the chat. So if it's overwhelming, rest assured, we are sending a follow up email after with all the resources, certificate, recordings, everything you need will be in the follow up email, too. Fantastic, Steph. Thanks so much. And I think you've got a week left, right? If you want to join in for our Outdoor Learning Winter Challenge, free, amazing outdoor learning resources into your email, ideas for lessons, uh, opportunities to win phenomenal prizes. Um, so please join us. And by the way, uh, speaking of prizes, make sure you stay all the way to the end because after the presentation Q&A, uh, there will be some fantastic prizes for four lucky winners. Um, okay. Thanks, we're gonna... Sorry, I forgot, to, <laughs> no, I forgot to even mention the Winter Challenge. Thanks for plugging it. <laughs> I normally forget three or four things and you're like, Ahem. so together we can do anything. <laughs> we can remember all of the things um okay some amazing partners before i um give you a little poll um uh these people um are working internationally across north america and um locally in order to uh give you the access to the best tools equipment and resources around outdoor learning um these amazing partners you can click on the website through um that steph just shared and you'll go straight to them um whether you're an early childhood educator looking for support on uh, how to get outside and play for example or any of those there's too many to go through them all individually so i'm going to pass them through We've got some amazing us friends and uh some amazing advisors that, that are working really hard to um do their best oh but it's so exciting because we've got some new resources that these amazing educators joining us today have helped develop um and have been i mean developing and and testing and proofing with classes for some serious amount of years um but it's so amazing that we've got these beautiful things coming in um and um, we've got Patty Kay and Jill. But quickly, before we go in, I do just want to give a little poll. You know we love a poll here. So uh, let me scroll down and find um, the first one for you. So I'm going to launch these. So first question, you can scroll down for question two, is where are you joining from? Um, we used to split it down into just Canada and the US into all the different sort of areas of that. But what we were finding last series, we had like 47 plus countries represented. So we wanted to see if anyone's joining us. We've never had anyone from Antarctica, I believe, though. I know they have the Internet. Um, OK, and who are you of the 490 nearly people here? Um, what kind of educator are you? And all are welcome. I'm going to let it run for just like another five seconds. Unfortunately, if anyone raises their hands, we can't have you unmute and share, um, but you can use the Q&A or the chat box if you need tech support or you want to ask a question, please feel free. And if uh, you don't see yourself represented in that list, please feel free to um, type in the chat where you're joining us from. OK, closing in five, four, three, two, one. OK, and I'm going to share the results with you. So. Big Canadian crowd today. Okay, we've been hovering around 50-50, so uh, welcome. But all are welcome. Uh, nobody from elsewhere at the minute, but lots of people watch the recording. So um, if you're joining us in the recording from a, a more convenient time zone, because we know it's the middle of the night uh, if you go across the pond, um, welcome, welcome. And so, look, I love this, though, because this is, is almost now a given that we are seeing this amazing range of educators from formal educators to people doing more informal work or this admin or support people. All of you are amazing. Thank you so much for being here and being part of this community because this work is so vital um, for our well-being, for the well-being of the planet. And we're just grateful to be here with you. Uh, and so the two fantastic people sharing with us today. 
And Patty Kleneshiko has worked as an environmental educator for 20 years. Did I say it right, Patty? Almost. I, I, I normally I would practice, but we were having um like a reverse escape room situation getting prepped for this so instead of like trying to break out of those escape rooms if anyone's done that we were all trying to break into zoom um and it was resistant uh so here we go uh, i do apologize pay um patty's in her element when teaching outdoor ed and i have learned from you in some of your professional development workshops uh, and enjoys helping young people find meaningful connections to their natural environment and jill has also been working in environmental education for enormous amounts of time don't look old enough um but lots of different capacities through the career singing and dancing as an interpreter and um and also developing and designing environmental education programs in bc and beyond um i'm so grateful that you're both here with us today i'm going to stop sharing and pass the education baton Wonderful. Thank you so much for those amazing yeah. welcomes, Jade. Thank you. And we'll just get our screen <laughs> sharing happening here. All right. All right. So Kisa Kukit, good evening, everyone. We are so excited to have you joining us tonight as we embark on a journey of mystery and wild wonder with you. Whether you're eight or 80, Identifying wildlife tracks is one of the most rewarding experiences a, a nature lover can participate in. Mm -hmm. You become a detective searching for clues as to what animal has left its calling card. And if you look more closely, you can also gain some information about their behavior. Like a true Agatha Christie novel, the stories of the wild can be mysterious and captivating a world of clues and signs and a world that we're excited to be bringing you tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. And before we continue on here, we just wanted to acknowledge where we're, we're bringing this presentation to you from tonight. So Patty and I are both here in Kimberley, BC, uh, which is the unceded territory of the Tanaha people. Um, and it's with great honor that we teach, we play here, we explore here, we and look for animal animals, tracks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and we just want to acknowledge that our tra our traditional hosts that have been here for many millennia before us, and and we honor their welcome to us and their graciousness um, to to from them to all of us who seek knowledge in in these places. Yeah, so tonight we have some, so I think some really great things to share with you. Um, we're going to tell you a bit about the wonderful organization that we work for, WildSite. We're also going to explore the track sheet resource and why tracking matters. You know, why do it? Why is it important that we bring this to our learners? And bringing the stories in the snow or mud, depending on where you are, or, you know, we've got some mud here too, yeah. um, to life. <laughs> And then also Jill and I have been doing this for a long time. So we want to share some of the, the great activities and extensions that can go along with this resource and animal tracking. Absolutely. All right. So let's get into it here. Um, so you'll see this is our lovely Patty here mm -hmm. leading one of our many environmental education programs that WildSight offers um, and which we've been offering for, you know, almost two decades now. Mm -hmm. Um, we've been delivering education, conservation, climate action programs for over 36 years. And during that time, we've connected over 100,000 learners to their wild backyards. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also been able to connect almost 4,000 teachers just through um, professional develop opportunities and workshops and working th with them through multi-day programs like um, our Eco Stewards program. We've got programs like our 15-day accredited mm -hmm. paddle trip, which is the Columbia River Field School. Um, and with all of our programs that we offer with WildSight, they're always deeply rooted in, in place-based learning. Um, and today, this learning is delivered by 20 of our highly qualified environmental educators, two of who are with you tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and over decades of delivering environmental education programs and working with thousands of teachers, it's given us a lot of insight, mm -hmm. you know, into the yeah. resources and the tools that help educators like yourselves uh, bring the stories of the wild to life. So tonight, we're going to share with you a brand new resource um, that was created by educators for educators uh, to make seeking out and learning more about the mysteries left behind by our wild neighbors really fun and really engaging. And we'll share more details about that resource a little bit later on. But for now, 
we invite you to mm -hmm. grab that nature detective hat, <laughs> plop it on your head, and get ready as we dive into the world of how to solve the mysteries in our wild backyards. So the art of animal tracking and why it matters. Well, animal tracking is an ancient human skill mm -hmm. that's been that's been teaching people about their environment for thousands of years. For our ancestors, tracking was extensively used um, around the world for hunting to acquire food, but also to stay informed about the dangers that might be around. Today, in our areas of work, um, we use animal tracking in a beautiful way to introduce learners to the interconnectedness of their living things around them, to create a story of what's happening in their wild backyards, and to connect learners to nature in a hands-on and a meaningful and exciting way. So looking for animal tracks and signs gives us a chance to use critical thinking skills and scientific inquiry methods it's an incentive to learn about the different animals that live in your area and gives learners a chance to lead and problem solve in nature. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of fun. Oh well. my gosh, it is <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> All right, so now we kind of know the why. We're gonna kind of dive into also what you might need if you are you know, taking a group of students out and you wanna dive into exploring animal tracking. Absolutely, I think one of the first things you need to do is probably you know, pack that that nature detective kit. Yeah, exactly. Um, always like to bring out some magnifiers to really kind of get down and get looking around and seeing what's around. Um, also some um, rulers mm -hmm. uh, to measure the gait and the size of the animal tracks. Um, we love to bring out stuffies and I know Jill's awesome at bringing out the puppets. She always does amazing little things with that. <laughs> yeah, so bringing out little animals that are maybe are connected to your local area. And one of the things I think we we always bring with us, um, or if the teachers that we're working with can, is sit pads. They are really essential, um, whether it be snow or mud. It just kind of gives them a comfortable little seat, kind of mm -hmm. sets the stage, and it can be used for so many different, uh, you know, ways. But warm bums, happy learners. Absolutely. <laughs> so. <laughs> so just a few of the things that you can bring out with you. Um, and before we head out really on any outdoor learning opportunity, including animal tracking, it's really important to awaken all of our senses so that we're ready mm -hmm. to see all that is being offered out there for us to see. Uh, so one of the first things you may want to invite your learners to do is to open up yeah. those deer ears, right? Listen to the sounds that are happening in nature. Can they hear any chirps or songs or maybe yips or howls or any tap, tap, tapping? Um, and the next thing maybe you're going to invite them to do is to, to um, tune into that coyote nose. Mm -hmm. So can they smell the smells of nature? Is there anything musky happening out there or sweetness in the air? And then finally, something that's very important to, to looking at animal tracks is to, to open up those eagle eyes, right? So do you see any signs of, of life and, and what could have left those signs behind and what are the things you're seeing are you seeing scat or mm -hmm. fur or feathers or rubs rubs yeah. Yeah. scratches nests yeah maybe maybe some food and trails left behind or maybe patty just maybe <laughs> you're seeing some <clears throat> animal tracks, tracks. <laughs> Yeah, so various ways that we can kind of uh, explore and, and have that whodunit sort of perspective and looking at animal tracks is counting toes. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to kind of explore that further, but also looking at the gait and the movement of the animal. You know, is it running? Is it galloping? Is it is it, you know, just walking kind of stealthily um, and also patterns. Um, and then other signs and clues. So, you know, a lot of this, we can really even tie into other aspects of the curriculum, which is great. Yeah. We'll look at numeracy and literacy, and we'll explore that further. Absolutely. All right. So counting toes, let's go, let's go there first. Yeah. So this is a great one to start students with um, in, in, from an early age in, in kindergarten, because, you know, we look at the kindergarten curriculum, we were counting to 10. So if they can count to five, they can animal track. So the first one would be the one toe animals. And I usually we'll go over this with the kids so then they really got it. So usually the one toes are, or that solid toe would be maybe an us in our, and using in our, our, in our boots. So yep. getting the kids to actually look at their boots and the size of their boots and how they're moving. Also animals like a horse. So they might have their horseshoe. 
And snowshoe hare actually, although they do have five toes, we often don't see that. So they'll kind of have more of a, a, a larger um, um, back paw and then their smaller paws that uh, that are in front. So that's one way of looking at it. So one toes. One toes, yeah. And then the next one would be the two toes. And two toes are usually the ungulates. So those are animals like your deer and your elk and your bison, moose and caribou, mm -hmm. sheep, goat. And those animals are often going to have two, um, two um, hooves. And so you'll see that. Yeah, pretty distinctly. Yeah. And especially if you have some fresh snow or mud to look in. Um, and this is where you can jump into not just counting, but maybe some shape work as well. Mm -hmm. um, so especially when you're looking at a track like a deer track, it's a pretty distinct heart-shaped track. And then you can tell just from the heart-shaped track of the deer, you can see and start to solve the mystery of which direction were they traveling. Um, so you're always, for, for these types of tracks, like the pointy uh, part of the track is going to be the direction in which the animal was traveling. Mm -hmm. Oops. Oops. All right. So the next one is the three toes, and those are mostly birds. So whether whether it be a perching bird, a little chickadee, no. <laughs> I heard those today, <laughs> a chickadee or uh, a turkey or a raven, uh, whether it be also a webbed-footed um, uh, bird like a duck, um, they're all going to have that three toes, but they're going to look a little different. An owl might look different too, because we'll see the claws or the talons mm -hmm. on them, or we might even see the feather or the, when they're dropping down, you might even see some, a wing pattern, which is pretty cool. Amazing. It's like a snow angel left behind by a, uh, it's just incredible that wingspan in the yeah. snow. Yeah. So three toes are mostly birds. So now yeah. we've got our one, two, and three, and now we're going to move to our fourth one, which is our canines and our felines. So when we see four, we know either it's a canine or a feline. If we see claws, we know that it's a canine because felines can retract their claws. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of a little hint and clue that if we see four and we don't see any claws, good chances that it's it's a dog or a wolf or a coyote uh, fox. Um, so we're going to kind of be able to use our detective work on that. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, something with our, our canines, especially, um, especially areas like here in Kimberly, or I'm sure a lot of the places that our listeners are coming in with us tonight um, is, is we have a lot of domestic dogs out there, which their pop size, depending on the size of the dog can look very, very similar to that of our, our wild dogs mm -hmm. or our coyotes or our foxes. Um, but the big difference here is when you, when you see your um, domestic dogs, like, you know, my, my dog, he is, he's not worried about finding this next meal. He knows he's going to get treats or he's going to get fed when he gets home. So this guy's, he's like doing parkour out in the forest. Mm -hmm. He's going this way and that jumping all over the place. But if you see the tracks left behind by one of our, our wild canines, they are on a mission. They are going to be staying in line and following the scent of their nose and trying to make the exact line they need to, to get to where they're going. So they're moving very deliberately mm -hmm. with a purpose and to cons and while moving, they're going to be conserving as much energy as possible. So just some other things for, for learners to take Absolutely. into account. Yeah. And so the next one would be our four, oh. four toes and five toes. And these are these really are so neat. cool. So generally they'll have four. Well, they will have four toes in the front and then five in the back. And so these would be animals like our rodents, mice, squirrels, rats, chipmunks, and they all vary depending on the size of the animal. Yeah. Um, you might even see a tail drag too. So for our little mice friends, you might see their their little tail. Um, and often maybe another clue might be a little hole that they kind of are running across a trail. But Patty, in this picture, to me, it looks like the five toes are in the front. Yeah. So I wonder what's going on there. Well, <laughs> what's happening there is that because a lot of their strength comes from their back legs, just like our legs are a lot stronger well, than our arms. Um, the, the animals using, putting their feet up front and then propelling or, you know, using it as propulsion to move their body forward. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on what they're doing, as if they're eating or maybe if they're running, their, their gait might be a little different. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit more about gait here soon, but just so neat. The five toe and four toe kids, they're just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. It's such a really, it's a cool tidbit to add in there. 
And lastly, our five toes. So that's us. Uh, that could be animals like the badger or wolverine, weasels and bears. And depending on the type of animal or the size of that animal, um, those tracks are going to look a little different, even in different species. So if you're looking at a grizzly bear as opposed to a black bear, the positioning of their toe pads will be a little different. And uh, you can find there's some great guidebooks that can give you some even more insight into um, how you determine between a grizzly and a, and a black bear or a wolverine and a badger. Um, but generally, five toes yeah. you can kind of see how just teaching kids about you know counting the toes already helps them kind of compartmentalize like where you know what animal it might be and so they can it can help them a lot for sure you can narrow things down a lot and then try to get down to okay then you're then you're asking the next question so maybe the next question that you're asking learners is well okay so they had four toes or they had four in the in the front five in the back but what do we, what can we go, where can we go next? So the next thing you probably want to dive into is the way that they're moving, mm -hmm. the pattern that they're leaving behind and the way that an animal moves. We, we like to talk about that as their gait. Um, so it's, it's, it, we have gait, you know, we typically, we typically walk sometimes when we're feeling really happy, we're going to skip. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we like to run. Um, so we, uh, us as well as our wild neighbors have different kinds of gait depending on um, their body size, the 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 reason of movement, um, and what's happening happening around them, and that all builds into this mystery that we're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we see a snowshoe hair track, and you can see that they was cautiously, you know, feeding and nibbling and resting when all of a sudden it heard a predator coming up or, or a person even, um, and it and it hopped away really quickly. So the the way that their paw their tracks are going to be laid out in the snow or the mud is going to change depending on what they were doing at the time. So we like to think of gait and animal movement patterns and there's lots of different ways that you can categorize these, but the four main one, ones that we like to use are our diagonal walkers, our pacers, mm -hmm. our hoppers, and then the bounders. So let's dive into those just a little bit here. So our diagonal walkers. So these are our felines, our canines, our elk, mountain goat, mm -hmm. deer, moose. Um, and you can see if you look at the image in the middle here, if you were to draw a line from the, the first track to the one that's below it there, it basically makes a diagonal line. You can also see here that they are going to capitalize mm -hmm. on the tracks, especially in the snow that they left behind before. So for example, their front left foot, they're going to put their back left foot in the exact same spot if they can, um, so that they don't have to kind of pounce or put a uh, puncture a new hole in the snow, basically. Uh, so these are pretty common to see, especially with deer tracks um, or our, our domestic dogs out there too. So a really fun one to look at. And with any of these, and I'll just touch on this now, just when you're teaching these different um, movement and gait patterns to your learners, get them to do it because mm -hmm. it really does make it yeah. make more sense. You have no idea how many times I've been down on the ground and I've moved like a deer or I've, you know, kind of like uh, um, waddled a little bit like one of our other animals. And it's just, it's so cool to really tune into to what our wild neighbors are, the way that they're moving in order to to learn more about them. So with that in mind, next mm -hmm. up would be our pacers. And I don't know, for some reason, whenever I think of our pacers, I just think of them walking like, doop -a -doo. you know, they're kind of, they are wide bodied animals. Yeah. They're usually kind of waddling from side to side. Um, they're not... Um, they're typically not going to be reusing their the tracks that they've just left behind. And they're slower moving animals in general, unless they're, you know, being threatened by something. Uh, so basically the legs on one side of the animal tend to move together, followed by the legs on the other side. So again, strongly suggest you try this out. Mm -hmm. Maybe when we're off our, our meeting tonight for a movement <laughs> <It's a> challenge. <laughs> uh, so the next... Um, way that our animals like to or certain animals like to move her hoppers mm -hmm. these are probably one of my favorites um, they're a really interesting group that includes small critters like mice and voles and squirrels as patty was talking to um us about with our five toe and four toe animals and their track pattern shows the front feet landing closely together and the rear feet traveling to pretty much where their back or their um their front feet were to begin with <laughs> if that makes sense again 
you know, get up and try this maybe <laughs> after we're done. Um, but basically they're moving their back feet through. That's how they're propelling. As Patty said, they're using the strength of the back legs. Um, and this is really interesting to see in the first um track set there in the middle of the screen, you can see that this was a, perhaps a snowshoe hare just sitting, resting, maybe nibbling on, on a branch. And then it started moving and you can see how the back feet are now in front and kids just, they find that amazing. It mm -hmm. just really blows their minds. I think it's really neat also, if you have any really great videos to, to show yes. them some of these different movement patterns, because it's, uh, you have to kind of see it to, to believe it. <laughs> so, For sure. Yeah. Or see it in the wild. And then our bounders, these, I mean, these remind me if like, you, if you think kind of of an accordion, mm -hmm. you know, they're these long slinky bodies. Usually again, their back feet are going to be bigger than their, their front. And they're moving in that same pattern where they're going to be eventually moving, um, they're, they're, they're going to, you're going to be looking, sorry, for five toes. And when you see one moving along, they're going to sort of elongate their bodies mm -hmm. in those, those quick successions. And as they move the front two feet land first, allowing the rear two feet, which uh, land just behind or in front of them. And then they often overlap. So it's a great opportunity when, when sharing this with kids often, you know, we'll talk about it, but then we actually do it. So definitely it's an opportunity if you use, you know, you're using the track sheet or, or taking kids outside, you can do it in the gym, but you can also do it outside. So it's a great phys ed DPA sort of thing oh, yeah. to do with the kids. So Absolutely. getting them, you know, pretending they're a bear or, you know, a wolf or, you know, a pine martin. Yeah, so. super cool. So yeah, so sometimes animals don't leave their tracks. So, you know, putting their detective hats on, I get kids, we get kids often to kind of explore what are some other signs that animals have been in the area? And what clues have they left? So often we'll find things like, or discuss things like scat or droppings. Mm -hmm. um, midden piles are a great example as well. And that's usually a big pile of seeds and cones that squirrels have left browse as well so bite marks yeah. are off of twigs um around our area we see lots of uh rubbings from from uh the antlers of deer and right about now they should be dropping those off pretty soon mm -hmm. their sheds uh, we might see feathers or we might see blood we might see bones um so lots of great evidence that animals have been in the area and getting kids to explore that language behind it as well so bringing that aspect of literacy mm -hmm. you know talking about those things um, is, uh, you know, even making the spelling of the the week, you know, integrating some of these words might be another idea. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And just again, like putting all the pieces together, if they see tracks that end at a tree and they don't see them start again, mm -hmm. you know, getting them to really get into that inquiry space of, well, what animal can you think of that might you know, leave their tracks ending at the tree, could climb up. Would it be a snowshoe hare? Well, I've never seen a snowshoe no. <laughs> hare pop up a tree. So, you know, just using some of those wonder questions too, to, yeah. to help to le learn is to really put these uh, mysteries together. Uh, so, but what some, you know, sometimes you just can't find tracks out That's there. Right. So whether the, you know, you've just got some crummy snow conditions or there's just no um, good landscape to for the animals to have left tracks behind or they just they're well we've been to schools where there's it's inner city right like there's mm -hmm. no other than you know maybe crows or ravens uh there's really no like wildlife around so um but this is yeah there's... yeah this is a great way if you you know for for those times that you can't find any tracks um this resource the track sheet that we're going to talk a little bit more about um is a great one just to, to be able to build these stories in the snow um and we won't go into too many details because you can find all of the details about the track sheet on the outdoor learning store um but certainly it's been um that all the tracks here were drawn with mm -hmm. a lot of detail and, and a lot of love and and um, are all measured um, proportionally. So we've got all the scale um, included and the track sizes are real life track sizes. And it's it's just a really wonderful way. When you lay this track sheet out, the kids' eyes just like, yeah, it's yeah, beautiful. they light up. So there's some ways, you know, um, to bring this learning to life. Um, you can use different pictures, even, you know, these are going to be available. They are available on the outdoor learning store, but um, you can just use some of the photos that you have also, you know, you don't, you don't need to necessarily, um, 
I don't want to unplug what we're <laughs> offering here, but, um, you know, just it's a way if you can find some photos of the local animals that live in your wild spaces, bring those out with you when you're out looking for tracks and signs because photos mm -hmm. or like Patty yeah. mentioned before stuffies, they can really help to bring things to life. Having some of these tidbits of the natural history, really kids just like, they love it. They love knowing that, you know, snowshoe hares will eat their own poo. Like kids just <laughs> die over that. It's like the best thing ever. If you've learned anything from this workshop, now you know this information. <laughs> <laughs> And so we're just, um, we've just got a couple slides here, just showing some of the elements that are in included in the track sheet that is now available on the Outdoor Learning Store. Um, so just to help um, educators and teachers to bring the stories mm -hmm. to, of, life. to yeah. life that happen out there in the wild. And so here's just, this is what would be included in the kit. Again, we won't spend too much time here because I, we know that you can find this online, but. But I, <laughs> mine sitting over there and I just received it today and I am so excited oh to go gosh. out and uh, like, you know, use some of these tracks to, you know, to put in the snow so the kids can work on identifying it. And it's just, aw it's a great kit. Yeah. I'm we excited. As soon as I saw Patty, when I was walking <laughs> up to meet her today for our workshop, she's pulling the tracks out of her backpack and we're putting them in the snow. and. Yeah, they're super incredible. Just a great resource to have when you yeah. don't always, you know, have the perfect tracks to be exploring. So just some of the learning extensions that you can use when you're out looking for um, for tracks and 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 signs and and um, left behind by animals. So they're like Patty mentioned before, mm -hmm. lots of opportunities for literacy. So telling the story of what they saw and yeah. then using, you know, images and art to, to help to recreate that story. Yeah. And you'll see the bottom uh, picture there is actually a picture of the, the sheet um, that we took inside with the kids and we used uh, story stones for them to kind of retell their story of what was going on. Um, and that's a really effective way to, you know, integrate sort of that, you know, going out and seeing and playing and then the, you know, telling a story and then either writing it or drawing it or however, whatever age, um, you know, students you have. Um, and also integrating math as well. Oh, so, yeah. you know, utilizing the tracks sheet and all the information um, here, you'll see a black Black bear track that we found um, and just using uh, cubes to help students, you know, talk about estimation or perimeter. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can you can use um, this track kit um, and just share, you know, this can be like a whole unit. This can go on for a long time. Oh, yeah. Um, and the nice thing, the thing I like about the track sheet is that it doesn't have to be a one time thing. Like, I mean, we've been using the sheet for over, you know, 13 years with with schools and stuff. But even in my own teaching practice, I pull it out all the time, any time of year. Um, because it's just so effective and the kids just keep coming up with stories and ideas and we just, you know, take it in so many different directions. So it's not just a one-time thing. You can use it many times um, throughout the year too. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if there's, if you're looking for some extensions or some additional resources to use when you're outside looking for animal tracks and signs, um, you can go to the WildSite website. We have an extensive library of um, environmental education resources, um, and one of which is just this simple track sheet um, mm -hmm. that we've kind of created that you can print off. Um, this could lead to a good scavenger hunt or yeah. bingo, bingo or... Yeah our toe counting, right? See, you know, how many you could cut these out and, and have them um, put them into groups, like mm -hmm. two toes, three toes, four and five toes. Um, so lots of different ways. So you could use a resource like this, um, or you could just create this, like Patty said, I mean, it could be included in this whole unit um, around local animals. So even choosing one animal, like if, if all your students wanted to pick their favorite or, or a track that they've seen, and you can include this um, just simple literacy uh, sheet. So, you know, having them draw their, their animal and then um, who made the track. Mm -hmm. So having some guessing and, and estimation and prediction work going on. Um, and where did you find it? And, you know, building upon the story and um, three events that might've happened to that character while they were out there. And then what happened? What was the end? Was it you know, the story of a little mouse that yeah. you all of a sudden saw its its tracks end after you saw this big owl snow print in the ground. So lots of different ways that you can um, build in literacy and, and art and creativity into animal tracks and signs as well. 
I'm just wanting to share just a little video too here. Just um, these are some mm -hmm. uh, local Kimberly kids uh, grade one class that I actually had the pleasure to take out recently. Um, and I used the track sheet with them and it was just so incredible to be able to lay it out and have them really look closely at some of the tracks that they might see while they're exploring. And indeed, a lot of these kids did did see some of the tracks that were on the sheet. Um, and some, you know, we had some pretty wild stories happen when we asked them to go in and build some mysteries mm -hmm, and share mm -hmm. stories with the with their their for um, other students. So I'll just play this. <laughs> Yeah, so just, you know, we I took the kids out, we we incorporated stuffies and puppets to create some stories. And then the kids went around and looked for their mm -hmm. own signs of life, which was or um signs of, you know, animal tracks and signs, yeah. which was so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like I and it's I, a great tool. It's yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think you've done this a lot with the with your yep. students as well. When they you, love it. They love it. Yeah. Yeah. So many different uh, ways and directions you can take it in terms of the curriculum. It's great. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so that's that kind of wraps up our workshop for now. Uh, just beyond this, you know, getting out there, getting looking down at what's happening on the ground, up in the trees, mm -hmm. um, uh, like all the the plants that are surrounding you, they can also tell a huge story of what's going on. So, not just looking for tracks, but looking for all the other signs, the stories that the forests are mm -hmm. trying to tell us um, or any of the wild places that you like to visit, it's pretty incredible. And it's so fun to watch students um, immerse themselves into that and to really take that opportunity to, mm -hmm. to kind of become these animals and to, you know, just to get that intuitiveness of, of, you know, moving like them, smelling like them, Mm -hmm. You know, what are they looking for out there if they were a coyote or a fox or a deer? Yeah. Um, and just such a really neat way to, to to help them to fall in love with the the wild and natural world. And um, yeah, so thank you so much for for having us here tonight. I, yeah. Was there anything else? No, Patty, that, that's, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think Jade might talk a little bit more about, you know, where you can access these resources if if you are curious about them. But um, and again, just the the wild site environmental education uh resource page is an excellent spot to it's amazing yeah to yeah. find some more resources to help to to bring some of your outdoor um tracking and animal mystery mm -hmm. work to life so thank Stop. you thank you so much um that was just excellent um as i knew it would be and yes those amazing there's lots of free wild site resources and they're really beautifully presented as you can see of the quality of um the way it was presented through this presentation so they're like really beautiful like on one page uh, stuff that you can really access and use really easily um and yes the tracks and traces kit and some other bits and pieces um steph's got the links you can get them from our non-profit outdoor learning store and there is that discount code that steph can share again um for registrants of this this has been recorded um it will be sent uh, in the follow-up email that you'll get tomorrow by lunchtime but okay we've got some questions we've got time to answer them which is so fantastic thank you so much for packing all that in uh in such a short time so um Marsha asks, how successful were children at identifying wildlife from real tracks after they'd used the various investigation tools? Mm -hmm. Have you seen them be sort of successful in a sort of like, oh, that's actually an animal? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, especially when we're, we are out in the in the forest with them, a lot of our programs were able to take them out. Um, and so we do go for a little inquiry kind of walk, you know, put our detective hats on and our magnifiers and they will they will definitely see those patterns. They'll notice the snowshoe hair or see the little tail of a, of a mouse. So they will make those connections. And I think the key is also repetition. So really, you know, kind of talking about looking at the toes and, and you know, you know, the more they do it. 
um, the more they will definitely, you know, be able to identify that. So, you know, not just doing it one time, but doing many times. And then there's some, you know, it's kind of nice when they, they don't necessarily identify the animal correctly, because then it, it, it opens up this whole discussion of, well, it probably isn't a wolverine because we are here in town and, you know, talking about some of the, um, the needs and the adaptations of a wolverine, then it can just open things up for that discussion. So there's never a wrong answer. I don't feel when it comes to, to tracking and, and looking for animal tracks and signs, because they're, they're, they're so different. They're so diverse. And then yeah. there's just so many wonders that you can really dive into. And then, and then you start to, like Patty said, the yeah. more you do it, the yeah. more, you know, it's just like any detectives out there. The first case is probably a pretty hard one to solve. And then, you know, once they yeah. do it a few times. And it opens up some really great discussion also um, on, on uh, sometimes kids will say uh, animals that aren't even in the area yes. or even like in our, <laughs> on our continent. Like yes. it's, it's like, no, um, you know, but uh, so we can explore, you know, different animals in place. Like, so what animals live here? So having, you know, kind of scaffolding them in terms of building on that knowledge of what animals might we see in the winter time and often we'll talk about you know how do animals you know deal with winter you know do they migrate do they you know stay and cope or you know do they hibernate so having those discussions of what you know possibly could that animal be in the winter time um and do we have you know pterodactyls or yeah you know, like, so, you know, so it's really interesting you know, things that kids say and so you know we never you know we just kind of have that discussion about you know learning more about those animals that they're interested in as well yeah that's so beautiful and it's a uh, you've sort of led on like someone Jill was asking about can you distinguish between a bobcat and a domestic cat and fishes mm -hmm. and so and I feel like some educators I work with they're like well I don't know the difference or you know and they feel a bit intimidated by that maybe but then you can go out and learn together mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. and just always learning you know when you're out for your walks or your runs or just take a minute to pause and just to you know because it can be intimidating it's um and and we don't know we're I, mean, not, I don't know at all I mean no you know, I, what no. <laughs> 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 you know I mean we're always learning and and yeah. um it's it's great when you're kind of challenged and you're like you know I actually don't know and and admitting to that and just saying well how are we going to find that out and you know pulling out your your tracking guide and I and, love saying I don't know yeah that's the best like, yes. <laughs> answer that an educator or a teacher can give yeah, it let's find out yeah you know, or let's totally. learn together. let's learn together yeah. absolutely and it's that modeling that fun like that sort of um that i don't have all the answers and 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 we don't always have to have all the answers in our life and we can go out and learn i've been doing math where we take rulers you know and we measure the size of tracks that we find and then we go back and we look at comparatively like oh is it a lynx or a cougar mm -hmm. um but ah they actually they're quite big and the one we saw was quite small and maybe that's how we could identify the difference between a domestic cat and a wild cat um but they have to you know test it themselves Absolutely. um okay oh my goodness Nadine's asking where do raccoons fit in and I remember this came when we were going with our one toes our twos our threes fours fives and how do we know where the raccoons fit in there well they've got the five in the front yeah and the or yeah. sorry, the, the the four in the front and the five in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're little scooters yeah. as well, I doing their little raccoon hands because they're so like they can open things. Yeah, they're like... <laughs> yeah. They've got like little tiny human hands almost. They're French. Um, yeah, we yeah. don't really deal with raccoons. <laughs> we are starting to get raccoons here now. It's not one of the animals we really talk about, but I know in places like where I grew up in Toronto, we definitely have raccoons there, and so people probably there know a lot more about raccoons, but. um um there's and another, isn't that the joy of learning person. what's in your place exactly yeah, yeah get to know what you have and uh, marcia was asking i'm wondering if river otters are bounders plus sliders has anyone ever seen an uh, otter do yeah. a, a nice oh, slide because that is yes. fun absolutely yeah i love that and that's the thing too with you know the terminology that we shared tonight it's it's a small chunk of how um you know professional animal trackers and all the literature that you're going to see out there there's a lot of different names for the way these animal moves uh they they move but absolutely I love that the river otter would definitely be bounding and then sliding I love that so much yeah 
Somebody yeah. asked, what is the tracking sheet made of? And what medium did you use to make the prints? Oh, great questions. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, the the artwork was done by um, a local artist here in Kimberly. <laughs> he does a lot of block printing and um, drawing and artist, artist work. Um, I won't her husband. It's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> he did a lot of research into, um, you know, track sizes, the gate, um, and, and incorporated that all into into his artwork. And he mostly used um, some tracks were done were were done using a, a watercolor pen, um, especially for the shading. Um, but mostly they were done with um, like acrylic paint. Um, and then the the track sheet itself. Um, it's a polyester sheet mm-hmm. um, and it's it, yeah it, it's and it's good to know with the, the sheets and just because we know we we've used these for years not this particular one but um, one that was actually handmade it's really important for care that when you use it especially if it gets wet or it has snow on it you want to you definitely like anything you want to dry it out like any of your gear um, like your a parachute or whatever you're going to want to dry that out and don't just shove it back in the bag um, just so for it has longevity to it as well. Yeah. Yeah. But absolutely. Yeah. And I'm reliably informed um from the powers that be that it is washable. It is washable. It's the in one the in your in the new washable. kit. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The one that I had that was homemade, you know, that was I did with a Sharpie pen. Sharpie, yeah. That was <laughs> yeah, not so too. much. <laughs> it, well, yeah. Anyway, this, yeah. So um, and if there's any questions at all outside of the workshop in terms of, of the artwork or the creation of the track sheet itself, we're very open to to chatting about that. So thanks for those questions. Okay, beautiful. Um, just time for a couple more. Um, how do you use the SCAT pack in programming? How are you introducing SCAT within uh Starts with an S and it ends with the T, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a scat rat. It's a song, actually. Um, yeah. You can find it on the internet. <laughs> so yeah. how do you, oh, you, you, well, you I think ideas? You, well, you can you just uh, build, it. yeah. Like you can, with the tracks, the the scat and then the, the track um, replicas, you could build your own story out there, you know? So maybe you have, you, you use the deer track uh, replicas to, to create the, the tracks in the snow, if mm-hmm. there aren't any around or in the mud or, you know, whatever um, landscape you're working on. And then, you know, then maybe you're putting that scat out there with that animal too. So it could just be a, an additional clue that the kids are finding. Um, you could compare them, you know, there's a lot of like the comparison between chocolate almonds and yes, chocolate almonds. that's my favorite. I turn it into a literacy, like a metaphor. It looks like, and the size of, and it reminds Absolutely. me of, you know, and talking about also exploring, like what are animals eating? You know, you can yes. tell a lot about an animal, you know, in round here, we get lots of grizzly bears and, and black bears. So depending, depending on the time of year. Um, you can see a lot in their scat too. So I'm talking about, you know, how, what are animals eating, you know, what, did, yeah. what was that? And it in? can tell a lot yeah. just about just the size of the animal that left it behind too, right? When you look at tiny, you know, just um, some of the smaller scats that you can find, you know, in the areas that you live compared to the bigger deposits for lack of yeah. a better word. Um, that's just, there's a story right there too. So um, lots of different ways to to use those. Amazing. Oh, I've just realized someone's requested. Could you stop sharing so that you're big? I forget. Oh, yeah. Which I love. Then we can just see your <laughs> smiling faces a little bit more. That's amazing. Oh. Um, okay, last question. Um, was talking about um perhaps people that are in um an area where they only have pavement in their learning environment or something like that. How might we maybe use the um uh the track replicas or the track tree in that kind of environment? Yeah, I think that's the kind of the perfect environment actually to pull out a resource like this when it when you're in a spot that you don't necessarily see it right there in your learning area and and maybe you're not able to go to a wild space. This is just a really beautiful way to bring these stories to life. Um and it's you know it beyond the track sheet itself, it's then doing the research and learning about um the different signs other signs that are left behind like you know for the ones that are included in this kit the scat and then looking at the track replicas and you could create um 
you could create your own little wild space, even in your concrete mm -hmm. learning area um, by using the track sheet and then all the other resources. That yeah, I can envision with the, with the, um, the molds, you could even like get sand and, and sort of like oh, yeah. some imprint. So the kids actually see what that looks like. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's sort of built for that type of environment as well, where you can just, you know, really introduce that to kids that might maybe not seeing, you know, a Lynx track in downtown Toronto or, mm -hmm. you know, um, or things like that. But they'll that. probably see a squirrel track. They'll or, know squirrels, you yeah. know, or, or, or a crow or, or, or yeah, so coyote. It's, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've definitely used like a, like recyclable, you know, like plastic carton that salad came in or something and make moon sand with the kids like with flour or or sand if they and it's an access and then they yeah they create their own impressions with the track replicas and um start to really like build a connection with it even if it's not natural in the ground itself absolutely one thing uh, we use around the track is also um telling a story so doing kind of a story creator so having you know maybe a stuffy or or a, you know something that gets the kids talking maybe modeling it first so that they kind of practice that maybe with a one word and then building on a story about what's going on here um I find that really effective I've done that with kindergartens you know all the way to you know higher grades and it works really well mm -hmm. um even using integrating movement so bringing in a djembe or some kind of drum or percussion and getting the kids to move their bodies like the animals so you know not, not always just sitting and looking but you know like we're we're kind of acting like that snowshoe hair and we're you know you know moving to the beat so really you can you can integrate it in so many ways mm -hmm. um and we've done that with kids lots so yeah it's just so fantastic uh, unfortunately that's all we have time for today um i'm so grateful for so much and i don't know if you've been able to keep up with the waterfall of words that have been coming in but people have been saying thank you so much what a great program uh how many amazing resources you've shared so again um the links went in there and you will get them in your follow-up email but you uh will pop the links in there for the wild site education page so much fun so many fantastic resources on there uh links to all of the resources that they've talked about and also others around this sort of tracks and traces um and you'll get the recording and uh link to get your certificate tomorrow i will say thank you so much um yeah always a pleasure and um just so much to learn and um you know, as someone who was introduced to some of these techniques a while back from you and then have practiced them and have seen them work from like kindergarten. So I've done it with grade 11s where they go deeper into it and then spark a research project around, you know, animals that might be having habitats decreased or things. It's just the possibilities are endless. Thank you for sparking that joy uh, and curiosity tonight. Um, okay, everybody, don't leave just yet. We're going to pull four random uh, prize winners from the list of attendees, all 400 of you. Stick around. Okay, first scroll. I have Tirza Rilkoff. Tirza Rilkoff. I'm going to... Um, T-I-R-Z-A-H. You uh, have won a $25 gift card to the Outdoor Learning Store. Please let me know if you are Canadian dollars or US dollars. Okay, next random scroll and it lands on Colin King. Colin King, you are a second winner of a $25 gift card to the Outdoor Learning Store. Oh my goodness. Right now we got, um, oh, please uh, send us a message or we'll send you a message asking if you're Canadian or US or you can put something in the chat if that's easy. Mm. Okay, Manisha Atam, Manisha Atam, um, you are a winner of a $25 gift card to the Take Me Outside store. So congratulations, we'll be sending you that. And the next one, Sherry Canavan. Sherry Canavan, you are the last and final winner tonight of a $25 gift card to Take Me Outside. To Jill and Patty, thank you for your expertise, your enthusiasm. Your puppet show is legendary, Jill. I have tried <laughs> in, in, and failed to mimic the one that you did once on Frogs, um, where he was, it was just in, incredibly good. Um, and uh, yeah, I work on my Thank accent. Thank you for having that so much. Yeah, so can we. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, super super. I'm deeply grateful. Thank you, Patty and I have been learning Tanakha. We were in class together a while back. Um, and Steph, thank you so much. Without your epic behind the scenes tipper tappering, uh, like tiny mouse fingers and feet, uh, none of this would be possible, and nobody would get what they needed um, in terms of uh, the technical support and things. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks. It's always a pleasure. Okay. Good evening. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good evening. Thank you.